Hassan Reddick gets fired, the Raiders see two big developments, and the WNBA is making some huge changes to its postseason. It's Monday, October 13th. I'm your host for today, John Shames, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're sitting down with PWHL player Kendall Coyne Schofield to discuss the rise of women's hockey and new opportunities for players. We also hear from Bain & Company partner Stuart Campbell about one of the largest untapped markets in sports right now. Plus, power conference commissioners speak out on the new Super League proposals, and the NFL is looking at an international Super Bowl. First, let's hit some headlines. We begin in the NFL. Star pass rusher Hassan Reddick, who's not played a game this season for the New York Jets, has been fired by his own agents at CAA Sports amid a contract holdout that has now cost him over $9 million in fines. Reddick, who was traded from the Eagles in March, seeks a long-term deal, but rejected the Jets' one-year restructured offer that would allow him to recoup some of his financial losses from holding out this season. Despite repeated pleas from Jets' ownership for his return, Reddick has stayed firm with his trade request, but now, if he doesn't report by week 10, risks losing his 2025 free agency. Something to monitor going forward here. Sticking with the AFC, but on the other side of the country, Tom Brady's bid to become a minority owner of the Las Vegas Raiders is expected to be approved by NFL owners. If it goes through as anticipated, Brady will become just the third player ever to hold an ownership stake in an NFL team. All the while, he's in the first season of his 10-year, $375 million deal with Fox Sports as a booth analyst. Previously, we've had some questions over the combination of these two ventures and whether it would water down his ability to do either of them at a Tom Brady level. But if there's anyone to try doing both and doing them both well, it's Tom Brady, and he'll probably succeed too. Sticking with the Raiders, John Gruden granted a big victory in his lawsuit against the NFL as the Supreme Court of Nevada agreed to rehear his case that had been previously rejected in May. Gruden, who resigned as the Raiders head coach in 2021 after leaked emails revealed offensive language, essentially claims that the NFL leaked those emails to force his resignation. He's seeking damages, arguing the leaks ruined his career and his endorsement deals. This ruling now reopens the case, allowing it to be reviewed by a seven-judge panel. Meanwhile, the WNBA is set to revamp its playoff structure starting in 2025. The finals will shift to a best-of-seven series, while the first-round matchups will follow a 1-1-1 format that sees a higher seed hosting games one and three. In the finals itself, in the seven game, it will be one, two, five, and seven for the higher seeded team akin to the NBA finals. Commissioner Kathy Engelbert also announced new expansion goals for the league, which is now aiming for 16 teams by 2028. Major cities like Philadelphia are among those being considered for new franchises. Commissioner Engelbert said, quote, the good news is that we have a lot of de demand from many cities. I'd say 10 or so, maybe even 10 plus at this point. Coming up next, we hear from Minnesota Frost captain Kendall Coyne Schofield, who joined Owen to discuss the blossoming PWHL and how it's offering a new, legit path for girls and women who want to pursue hockey professionally. That conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by the captain of the Minnesota Frost, Kendall Coyne Schofield. Welcome, Kendall. Thanks for having me, Owen. Hey, great to have you on. Uh, so let's get to know you a little bit. Um, when did you start playing hockey? Uh, I started skating when I was three, hockey shortly thereafter, around five. Wow. Um, and what's been, I mean, this is kind of a big, broad question, but I'm curious of just your experience about of the growth of women's hockey, you know, over your life so far. Uh, when did it feel like this was, you know, something that the rest of the world was taking seriously? I think the growth of the game is one of the things I'm the most proud of um, throughout my career. Um, from when I started as a three-year-old on the ice, not really seeing many girls in hockey skates, and when I was growing up having to play boys hockey only, to now that you see girls' teams, girls' leagues, you see women officiating, women coaching, now you know the new Women's Professional Hockey League and the PWHL. And so I think the growth is something that, um, it's been incredible. It's been exponential. It's the, something that I'm super proud of. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of players, 
from my generation, they grew up and people always ask, oh, do you have a brother that plays? And a lot of us say, yes, we have an older brother. And that's what, what got us into the game. Now, that's not the, that's not the, the question anymore. It's, you know, girls see, see women playing. They see it, it's more accessible. Um, they, they, they see other people who look like them playing the sport. Uh, so they pick that sport up for the first time. Um, and, and that's their first sport, along with, you know, soccer and basketball and hockey and, and other sports. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for a lot of people, the launch of the PWHL was kind of this zero to 60 moment of, you know, maybe they'd seen women's hockey in the, in the Olympics, but, uh, you know, just wasn't in the American sports consciousness. Maybe it was more so in the Canadian sports consciousness. Um, but, um, for you, was it more of like a steady progression of growth and recognition, um, leading up to that moment? I think it's been a long time coming. Uh, I think there's been iterations of women's professional hockey um, over the years, but those iterations weren't what the players, the, the league, the sport deserved. Um, they weren't provided with the resources that it took for it to be professional. All the players who, whether they played in the, the NCAAs or overseas, um, you know, for at least from my, from my experience, the second I walked across that stage as a college hockey player, uh, it's like, where am I going to get a job? Um, because the sport doesn't allow me to continue to play it as a full-time job. And so that's been the reality up until, you know, last year where players were quitting their full-time jobs because that's what they did to continue to play hockey. Um, and so I would say this is, it's been a long time coming. Um, and I think we're, we're finally here, we're here to stay. And I think now there's going to be so many young girls and boys who grew up with the same dream. Um, and that was, that was always the goal, uh, that if you're good enough to be a professional hockey player, you can. Um, and for, for girls growing up, it was being a professional hockey player and something else and something else um, that what, you weren't afforded that opportunity to be truly professional in hockey because the salaries weren't there. The, you know, the, the infrastructure wasn't there up until last year when the PWHL um, was started. And what kind of response have you been getting from the fans, you know, over the, over the first season? Uh, tremendous, uh, support. Um, I think, you know, you look at all six markets and the way that, uh, each team was received in their market, the way that the fans showed up, they showed out, um, you know, you saw merch fly off the shelves and, you know, just every, every game was, was incredible. And I think it just showed that this was so long overdue that, I think for so long, people would really talk about women's hockey every four years when you saw it in the Olympic Games, and then it would go quiet. Yet we weren't quiet. We weren't sitting idle for every four years waiting. And, you know, there was the iterations of, of professional hockey, but no one knew where to go, where to find it, how to find it. And so now it's there's no confusion in the marketplace. You know where to find it. You know what how to be a fan of it. You know how to watch it. You know how to support it. And um, I think that has only continued to grow the fan base and continued, it's continued to get you know, more and more kids into the sport of hockey as well. Now you've got one season under your belt. What do you think are the, you know, the big steps for this league as it continues to grow? Well, this year we have team names, um, which is super <laughs> exciting. So last year we were all PWHL, Minnesota, PWHL, Boston, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so now we're the Minnesota Frost, which is really cool to have that association, not only, you know, for us as players, but to our fans, to our city, um, and just to own it. I, you know, I think of, of the NHL and I'm like, I don't remember when any, you know, besides the Seattle Kraken and the Utah, you know, and, and Vegas, you don't really remember like when teams were like names were created. And so it's just really cool that we're all living in this moment in this history together. Um, and so the names are a big part of year two. We're going from a 24 game schedule to a 30 game schedule. Um, you know, I, I think that's, you know, what we we want to play more games. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, there's another, a draft. So last year, year one, there was a 15 round draft this year. There's a seven round draft. Uh, so the draft's even tighter, which I think the, the talent coming in is going to be incredible. I think we've seen more players from overseas come over to North America, um, to, to be a part of the league, which I think we want to continue to see, uh, year after year, because we want all the best players under, under one roof and we're there. And, um, we want to continue to, to see the best players all over the world, um, come under one one umbrella um so yeah i think it's it's going to be even bigger and better and um than than year one and it's it's super exciting yeah and a lot of that speaks to how obviously you know only a year in the the pwhl is still figuring out its brand i mean you, you only just got team names um you know the, the the league is still taking shape in a lot of ways do you feel like you know in spite of what i just said that 
the PWHL has a, an established brand at this point that, you know, is its own thing? I do. I, you know, as, as much as we are uh, in year two and we are a new league, women's hockey has been around forever. It just was a matter of people going out and finding it. Now there's no confusion. They know where to find it. They've known the players. You look at the players who are playing in the league. I mean, they're the greatest players in the world. Uh, they've been household names for a very long time. It was more so now they have the infrastructure to showcase their talent on a consistent basis, marketed the right way, you know, being treated as professional the right way. So they wake up every day and they work on their craft. They're at the rink, you know, on the ice for a couple hours, in the weight room for a couple hours. They're getting treatment, massage, you know, doing a video session, seeing a chiropractor practice all the things that it takes to be a professional athlete now these players are being afforded those resources so the product and the talent is even better than it than it's ever been because they're taking their first and their second job off their plate to now be able to be a hockey player and so um you know i i think while the pwhl is new uh it's just it, it's it's been such a long time coming and i know i keep saying that that it, it's like we didn't miss a step everyone is like yeah, this should have been around 15, 20 years ago. Like, all right, we're here. Let's go. Um, and a lot of the names you see and the, the new names you're learning, like it's it's uh, I would say people are are instant fans. And I, I think the one thing is when you walk in the door once, you, you can't wait to come back again. Mm -hmm. And how would you say it's you know, you're sort of separating yourself from the NHL like as a product? I mean, it's it's all hockey, obviously, but. Um, would you say that, you know, PWHL hockey is, is like a distinct flavor and brand and and feel to, to NHL? Absolutely. I think the game of hockey, you know, there's, of course, there's the tradition of, of the sport and there's the similarities and the rules and like things of that nature. But I think we're not afraid to to, to go against the grain, to not be traditional, to um, make sure that everyone walk, that walks in the door, player, players, fans, staff, etc., feel welcome they feel supported they feel heard um you know the the way that we got here we had boots on the ground we fought so hard to get this league to get this sport to a place where it's at that um you know i think when you it's one thing to live the dream but it's another thing to have to build the dream and the group of players in this league have built this dream not just for the players that are playing it but for the next generation of players and the amount of sweat equity the amount of just blood sweat tears um, difficult moments, the moments that, you know, for, I mean, for me, I've been out of college almost eight years of, you know, going to the rink, finding my own ice, finding my own weight room, going to get my skates sharpened and just doing all the things that I've had to do alongside all the other players just to continue to play the game that you're, you're, we're finally here. And we're, we're so appreciative of, you know, the efforts that all of the players have made to get us to this point um, that, I think it, it is a unique product. It is special. It's different um, than the NHL. Um, I think one thing that everyone saw last year was how physical the game was. You know, they walk in thinking that, it, it, you know, women's hockey, there, there's no check and it's not physical. They leave there being like, holy cow, that was like one of the most physical games I've ever seen. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, getting in the door and, and seeing the product and the talent. But, yes, I do, I do think um, – I, I think one thing I'm very proud of in the PWHL is just – how, how inclusive of a league it is um, that that I hope everyone that walks in feels welcome. They feel supported. They feel heard. They feel that this is this is a this is a league that I can support. Um, and I, I think we we've accomplished that in year one and we're going to continue to accomplish that in years two and beyond. Yeah, awesome. And as you you know look ahead to the next five, 10 years for this league, what would you like to see in terms of how it grows? Um, I think my goal would be like 10 years down the line. You know, I don't know how long it'll take. I, just, I can't wait for the moment to see a player sign a million dollar contract. I know that's, that's, you know, maybe years away. I remember the moment, you know, Trinity Rodman signed her contract in the NWSL and just how uh, amazing that was. And, you know, how that just becomes a new standard and a new reality um, as we continue to build and grow. But um, I think like, I think for me too, it's just also like, being around the kids in the community a lot and just hearing from them. I want to, I want to play in the PWHL. I think for so long it was, I want to go to the Olympics. And then you realize that's only every four years and that's only 21 players up to 20 in 2014, it was 21 players. And then in 2018, it, it, it bumped to 23 players. So you're looking at 23 players every four years play on this Olympic stage. 
Um, and, and that's what we talk about. And now it's, it's 30 plus games, six teams, you know, 23 players on a team. And, and hopefully the league continues to expand, you know, five, 10 years down the road, of course. Uh, so it's going to be more and more opportunities, but I think just seeing the opportunities that this league brings, not just, not just for players, but for, for coaches, for, for front office, um, workers, for, um, you know, just all departments across pro sports that, this league is now bringing more and more opportunities to so many people uh, aside from the players. Um, I'm, I'm excited for that and just excited for the dreams that are being born. You know, I can't even imagine how many dreams are going to be born in five years from now. Um, you know, I, I heard it this summer. I host a hockey camp here in my hometown and, um, you know, I saw the, the kids, the, the backgrounds of their, their iPhones and their Apple watches. It was a PWHL logo and they, we're, we're talking six and seven year olds. Um, and it just like, it's little moments like that where you see and you feel the impact, um, that's so far greater than, than, you know, the game on the ice. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Kendall Coyne Schofield, you know, good luck defending the championship in season two. And thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Owen. Over in the world of college football, one of the more up in the air seasons in recent memory continues its realignment induced craze. This week, Oregon and Penn State move up in the new AP Top 25 college football poll to numbers two and three, respectively, while Ohio State drops two spots down to number four. The volatility of the rankings week to week reflect the ongoing turbulence in the college football landscape this season, ushered in by realignment and a new 12-team CFP format looming at the year's end. As Texas, Oregon, and Penn State round out the first three positions, Recent surprises have made for big week-to-week changes in the top 25. Among the suggested changes have been new Super League proposals that would fundamentally change college football as we know it. However, SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey and Big Ten Commissioner Tony Petiti want us to pump the brakes on those a little bit. The commissioners revealed late last week that they rejected recent proposals to form college football Super Leagues backed by private equities such as Project Rudy and the College Student Football League. After a two-day meeting in Nashville, the commissioners emphasized their preference for keeping decision-making within the current four Power Four conferences, stating that there's no need for any outside involvement. Petiti said, I've yet to see a single thing in any plan that I've learned details about that contains things that we couldn't do ourselves and our Power Four colleagues as well. At the end of the day, there's a strong commitment that you have the ability to do all of this ourselves. Meanwhile, over in the NFL, ESPN is expanding its Monday night football simulcast on ABC, adding six more games to the 2024 season. This move increases the total now to 17 games shown across both networks, bringing the slate closer to last year's, which featured extra broadcasts due to writers and actors strikes that affected ABC programming. The additional games will further boost viewership for both ABC and ESPN, especially as ABC's primetime schedule heavily relies on reality TV and game shows. This all comes as NFL viewership has seen a 1% lift so far in 2024. Up next, we hear from Stuart Campbell, partner at Bain & Company, on the importance of reaching the underserved Latino sports fan and how the next wave of sports media will be ushered in by better Latino representation. Let's take a listen to that one now. I'm joined now by Stuart Campbell, partner at Bain & Company. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, great to have you on. So Bain put out a report recently about the Latino sports fan. To start, what motivated you to do the study in the first place? It's a great question. I think a couple of things. One, I mean, we're thinking about the future of sports, the future of fandom. And no matter how you cut it, you look at the demographics of this country and it's changing. Uh, part of it is age, obviously, we have an aging demographic, younger uh, sports fans, but also just culturally. And Latinos are going to be at the center of the future of sports fandom. So we think it's top of mind and an important uh, topic for leagues and teams around the country. And if you could unpack that, that sentence of Latinos are going to be at the center of future sports fandom, what do you mean there? It, it's a good point. So I think one is the Latino cohort is already huge. So Roughly 20% of the United States is Latino. And one of the most interesting stats that we came out through the report was actually their equivalent to the fifth largest GDP in the world already. U.S. Latinos are the fifth largest behind Japan and Germany. And so they are a very large cohort. As you think about the growth 
of this country, roughly 55% of growth is going to come from Latinos. And they will account for one in four Americans in 2050. And it's, it's not just that they're growing in size, they're also growing in influence and purchasing power. They're becoming increasingly educated uh, and, and their purchasing power is growing two and a half times faster than non-Latinos. And so as you think about the opportunity here, I mean, they are going to be a large and growing part of the country and they happen to love sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, the report says that this fan base, not only are they more engaged, you know, um, uh, than your average you know, than most of the country um, when it comes to sports, but they're also being underserved by U.S. sports leagues. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, so I think to your first point, a couple of data points that I think are, are relevant. One, 40% of them say that they are avid sports fans, higher than any population group. They consume 65% more sports and they're putting their purchasing power uh, to work. They're twice as likely to attend a sporting event and 75% of them bought sporting merch just a few years ago. So they are massive sports fans. But what the, the research actually highlighted to your point around feeling underrepresented is roughly half. So 47% said sports as a media genre is where they feel least represented. And this is a really big problem. When you look at 61% of them said they'd be more likely to watch a team or league if they felt represented on camera. Or 63% of them said they'd be more likely to buy from a brand if they felt like they were represented in the, in the commercials. And so representation is critically important to this group. And sports is something where they feel like they're getting left out. Yeah. And in terms of being left out, I mean, when you think of on the field or, you know, on the court or wherever, at least in MLB and MLS and, you know, soccer broadly, I think there's, there's plenty of, you know, Latin American people there. Um, but yeah, when you think of who's in the broadcast booth, you know, who's on the doing the sideline reporting, uh, often it's folks who look more like us. Um, is that where we're sort of the, the crux of where they feel left out? I think there's three places. I think you hit two of them. <clears throat> One is on the field. And to your point, it, is, it varies widely by sport. So MLS and MLB, you do see more player representation. Uh, second is in the front office. And so as you think about uh, less than 10% of executives in U.S. sports leagues are Latino, despite them being 20% of the population. So underrepresented and in some major sports leagues, less than 5% of executives there. So I think that's a huge challenge. And then three, I would say in media. And media is obviously in the broadcast booth, behind the camera, but also in commercials and, and in advertising. Um, for roughly 4% of me, uh, advertising dollars goes towards Latinos in this country. And so having representation there at sponsorship being a big source of revenue for sports, we think that's a huge opportunity. So it's representation both on and off the field. And um, are there leagues in particular where you think this is like especially important that if they want to grow and, you know, bring in as much revenue as they want to bring in that they need to invest in Latino sports fans? So I think every league <clears throat> should be paying attention. So I think that's the, the honest answer is there's such a huge opportunity. As I said earlier, 60% uh, of this country's population growth is going to come from Latinos. And so I think everyone should be paying attention. This is not just one league versus another, but uh, maybe some, some helpful data to put some context on it. We looked at the propensity of Latinos to watch various sports relative to non-Latinos uh, across you know, different leagues. And so if you look at Liga MX and the Mexican national team, Latinos are four times more likely to watch uh, those sports than non-Latinos. Not that surprising. Uh, following that is combat sports. So think pro boxing, UFC. Then interestingly, right after that was esports. So from a demographics perspective, Latinos are on average 10 years younger than non-Latinos. And so as you think about just a young demographic, more comfortable streaming where they, they consume a lot of their media, much more likely to play video games. Esports is on the rise. Then you've got the leagues like MLB and the NBA. Those are roughly at parity with non-Latinos. But then three leagues in particular had relatively less engagement from watching games. One, the NHL, right? I think hockey in general has struggled. The Arizona Coyotes just left Phoenix. I think two, the NFL, and then three, collegiate sports. So NCAA was the least likely to be watched on a relative basis of the Latino cohort. 
So as you think about where the gap is, where there is the opportunity, we think obviously every league should be paying attention to this trend, but those leagues in particular seem to have an area for improvement and you're seeing them take steps to, in order to kind of improve against that. Yeah, NHL, I'm not surprised to hear. NFL, I am surprised because, I mean, just NFL, <laughs> I guess they can't over-index everywhere, but um, but they're just, it's so popular and I, I feel like it's uh, becoming just mainstream in, in every part of American culture. Um, so that's, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, they're also a completely restless league in terms of where they can grow. So, um, and of course they just played a game in Mexico city. So, um, it'll be in interesting to see ha how that progresses. MLS, I think it's, this is where, you know, one place where they really need to be focusing because I mean, the world cup's coming, they need to be planting the seeds right now. So that in 2026, when what everyone calls the biggest sporting event in the history of the world comes to the U S Mexico and Canada, uh, they're ready to capitalize on that growth. And so when it leaves and people are still have soccer fever that they're thinking, well, there's, there's some soccer in my backyard. I think that's exactly right. So you've got the world cup, you've got the FIFA club world cup coming actually before that. I think a lot of the different leagues, different teams, Liga MX, EPL, everywhere is looking to the U S for growth. And MLS has obviously a very strong position here. And part of the investment that Apple made in the league was in part to go after the Latino consumer and their, their, their rapid soccer fandom. Yeah. MLB as well. I mean, I think we saw in the world baseball classic where Mexico, Puerto Rico, Dominican, of course, Dominican Republic, um, Venezuela, all, um, put up great teams or super engaged. Yeah. The players were obviously just like thrilled to be playing for their country. Um, I feel like it's a league that sometimes can't really get out of its own way when it comes to promoting itself. But, you know, this just feels like if MLB is not tapping into this population, you know, what are they doing? It's a huge missed opportunity. And I mean, part of the research highlighted <clears throat> that you think about the distinction for sports fandom by age cohort. I mean, older demographics like baseball, younger demographics like emerging sports. So if you look at actually the research would say for Gen Z, football remains the number one American football. But after that, it was other sports. So it was non-traditional sports like esports, surfing, uh, lacrosse, things that have historically not necessarily risen to the top. And so for a league like the MLB, which transparently is struggling with an aging fan base, yeah. they need to look for growth. And Latinos is an awesome way for them to engage that population. Yeah. And, and how much of this is just getting mixed up in, in age differences where younger people in this country are just more interested in, yeah, soccer, lacrosse, esports, volleyball, uh, as opposed to, you know, baseball, hockey, that kind of thing. So I think sports fandom is, is a big part of it. Obviously, baseball skews a little bit older. Uh, younger sports, as you kind of mentioned, soccer is as a higher proportion of that esports. What's interesting is also just the fragmentation of the landscape. Two interesting insights here, less related to Latinos, but obviously about how consumers are engaging sports. One, there's just a lot more sports fandom. So it's not just a fan of one or two sports. They're consuming a lot of different sports. And so it's edging out the larger sports, to your point, younger groups. And two, it's how they're engaging with media. So one of the stats that I found really compelling is 55% of people under the age of 35 are more likely to watch the highlights than the full game, which is twice as likely versus older cohorts. So what that means is people aren't tuning in to watch the full matches anymore. They're watching the highlights, whether it be on TikTok or Instagram or <clears throat> X, they're getting the, you know, the, the highlights from it. And so they're able to consume a lot more media and a lot more sports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an excellent point. Sometimes I wonder like, all these sports are getting more popular. The existing sports are remaining popular. Do, or do we just have more hours in the day now? But which we, we don't. But uh, I think that's it. It's just like people are watching snippets of every little thing. Um, okay. And um, any uh, any final words on just um, uh, the importance you see in you know investing in this population? So I think we talked a lot about the importance and the growth of the demographic here. The one stat that we, we haven't talked about is just the economic impact that they're going to have. One in three incremental dollars spent on sports is going to come from the Latino cohort over the next 25 years. 
like nearly a third of the incremental dollar spent. That's equivalent to 25 to $35 billion a year. And so not only is the, the demographic shifting, but the economic influence they're going to have on the sport is massive. And just how you engage them is critically important. We think it's obviously developing direct relationships to delivering culturally authentic offerings 365 days a year, right? Not a, a Latin night or Hispanic Heritage Month. These are mainstream consumers now that need to be engaged all the time. And we think it's important to engage them where they are. I mean, this population is more likely to stream, more likely to engage on their mobile phone, and much more likely to engage in social media. And so as you think about engaging and reaching out to them, it's streaming platforms, mobile optimized content, and making sure you're, you're reaching them on social. Those are some of the things we wanted to do to kind of start the dialogue here. But we think this is going to be a huge topic over the next decades to come. Stuart Campbell, appreciate the insights. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having us. Time for Front Office Sports tomorrow, where we look ahead to the biggest things coming up in the business of sports. The Super Bowl could be coming to a country near you. Yep, you heard that right. Not just a new state, but a new nation entirely. Following this week's London game, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell hinted at the possibility of hosting a Super Bowl outside of the U.S., a notable shift from his 2023 stance in which he said, quote, I think right now our formula will stay the same about playing in cities that have franchises. Goodell acknowledged that while traditionally the game has been held in NFL cities, quote unquote, things change. The NFL's international expansion is evident as they continue to schedule games in London and other cities this season with plans for a Madrid game next season too. But this would take things to an entirely new level. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you're subscribed on the platform of your choice. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.